Hi, I'm John Knights, and I'm the chairman of Leadership Global and the lead author of Leading Beyond the Ego, How to Become a Transpersonal Leader. And we're going to talk today about transpersonal leadership and about our ego. How's your ego? Stay tuned and find out. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips, part of the Full Monty Interview Series. I'm your host, Dov Barron, founder of Full Monty Leadership, and I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness so you can reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. Today, we're going to be taking an insider look at leadership that goes beyond the ego. What would it look like? And is it simply a nice fantasy, or is it something that's actually highly practical? Stay tuned. You're about to find out. Remember, you can chat about this show or any of our past episodes on Facebook, on our group in Facebook, which is Dog Brown's Leadership and Loyalty Podcast. Find the group in there. If you're a new listener, a new viewer, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go full Monty. Remember, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you tune into podcasts. And remember, we always need your help in staying relevant. So please get over to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. When you do, please go back to that Facebook page on Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Podcast on Facebook. Tell us where you put your uh, rate and review, and maybe we'll give you a shout out on a live show. Uh, you can also catch us on traditional radio stations across the United States every Monday and Thursday, all the way from Las Vegas to Florida. Also look for us on Roku TV, where we have over 100,000 subscribers. And if you're a regular listener, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners, with a potential reach of 2.5 to 4 million listeners for every show. We're honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. By the way, you can listen to us on Google Home and Alexa by simply saying, play Dove Baron podcast. Again, thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. All right, let's strip it down, dive right in. As a leader, whether you're a CEO, someone in the C-suite, a sales leader, an entrepreneur, or a leader in any capacity, you know that leadership has gone through many dramas and changes in the last few decades. And as much as we have moved away from the command and control style of leadership, the rise of dictatorial, dictatorial leadership is showing up all over the place, not least of all in politics. So the question is, what is the next evolution of leadership? And how can we implement it without getting crushed under the boots of the rising new wave of dictatorial leadership? Well, stay tuned because you're about to find out because our guest today is John Knights. John Knights is the author, uh, is an author and expert in trans transpersonal leadership. He is the author of, of Leading Beyond the Ego, How to Become a Transpersonal Leader, and the chairman of Leadership Global. With a global international business background, he is recognized expert in transpersonal leadership, the kind of leadership we are so desperately in need of in the 21st century. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and help me welcome Mr. John Knight. The crowd goes wild. Welcome, John. Good to have you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. My absolute pleasure, my friend. I'm, I'm actually really excited about having this conversation. I love conversations about leadership and certainly about ego and because um, some would say never the two shall meet because <laughs> yeah. as in that's where they live. There is no separation. Um, your focus is on promoting transpersonal leadership as a necessary approach to say sustaining success in the 21st century. Let's start at the very basics because I think there's very likely that there are many people who don't know what transpersonal leadership is. 
So if you could sort of give us a, a brief understanding of that to start. Okay, so transpersonal leadership is the kind of leadership <coughs> that is ethical, authentic, caring, and sustainable. That's the, that's the root cause of it. But it sounds, it sounds obvious and it sounds quite easy. Um, but I think what I've found over many years of working with leaders is that what is really necessary is for leaders to work on themselves. Mm -hmm. It's all very well to think about strategy and reorganizing and getting the marketing right and the branding right and the advertising right. Absolutely. But, but at the end of the day, customers know whether that's genuine and authentic or not. I mean, you know, we can, we can think of adverts we see every day on the TV. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so my call is to those leaders that if you want to be an, a leader that is appropriate to lead organizations in the 21st century, which is, as we all know, is so much different than it was in the 20th century, then Absolutely. we really have to work at it. And the, the, the key things that we have to do is to raise our self-awareness. Yes. We have to raise our awareness of other people, of how other people react to us and how they are performing. We have to, under, we have to be more aware of the world around us, not just in our own little um, cosmos. Yes, um, yes. But beyond that, we need to be, and I think most people will accept that these days, that we need to be more emotionally intelligent. But where yes. many people accept on a theoretical basis that we need to be emotionally intelligent, very few people in my experience actually get down into the nitty gritty of actually identifying those behaviors that would improve their performance and then working on practicing to improve those granular behaviors that would make all the difference. And often the times, the challenges that, um, uh, particularly in the context of emotional intelligence, we've spoke about this many times on the show, and I actually uh, speak on it uh, uh, from the platform and work with it inside of companies. The challenge oftentimes with emotional intelligence is even the people who are quote unquote trained in it, have taken workshops or trainings of some kind, very often uh, they think that emotional intelligence is something I'm learning in order to use on the people I lead yeah. rather than it's something I needed to use on myself for self-awareness. How do you confront that? Because, of course, you and I both know that that's ego. That is exactly yeah. what we're talking about, is that egoically, I learn a skill to use on you, and it's got nothing to do with me. So how, how do you confront that? <clears throat> well, I, I mean, that's an excellent question, because um, when, when I started on this journey, sort of post-corporate and post-entrepreneur to help leaders to, to develop, we started with emotional intelligence. At the beginning, mm -hmm. emotional intelligence in the early 2000s was was sort of a bit was still out there you know still out there at the edge mm -hmm. um, but what we realized after not too long was although it was helping people develop um very um good granular behaviors it was also open to manipulation mm -hmm. uh, because you know you can use those behaviors for negative things as well as positive things so it then comes down to values and so the ad advanced part of the the journey that we develop for leaders is actually bringing those values your own core values to full consciousness mm -hmm. so you're actually aware of, fully aware of those values the old the old adage that you leave you know your values and your private life at the front door as you come into the office you know i probably did that for 25 years before i i learned that it doesn't work and all it does is make you stressed Mm -hmm. uh, but you have to be your the real you if you're going to if you're going to be a happy person if you're going to be fulfilled you have to be the real you the whole time and the only way you can do that is to know what your core values are bring them to full consciousness right. and then you once you once you've got that then you can start thinking about how do i manage my ego whereas um before that, you have to learn to manage your emotions. I think the new state is we have to learn to manage our egos. And we have to right. understand which are the drivers that, that cause us to be egotistic. And it's not that being having an ego is immoral. No. 
we all need to have an ego at times and we all have to think of ourselves at times you know the old thing about if you don't love yourself then you can't love anybody else it's a little bit the same with ego but the where the problem comes is that people don't differentiate when as a leader you've got a responsibility to the organization and to the stakeholders of that organization whether it's the shareholders or the employees or the planet but the but what is really important is to be able to bring that, you know, those drivers of your ego to full consciousness so you can make a proper decision. You know, am I making that decision for my career, my personal career, or am I making it for the benefit of the stakeholders? It may be that sometimes you can do both, but it's about being aware and being conscious of that. But but just to sort of address that for a minute, John, because as you know, you and I had talked about before. I, I wrote a book on ego. I wrote a book called "Don't Read This, Your Ego Won't Like It." Um, and you know, and one of the things we know about ego is um, that on the surface of it, when we talk about ego, people think about being egoic, which is not the same. Egoic is you know, look at me, I'm the best thing in the world. I'm, you know, I'm the bee's knees. Uh, but at the same time, ego can be what most people don't understand is the part of you that says you're a piece of crap and you're never going to come become anything. That's also ego because it's about survival. It's about how did you survive? And the problem with ego, uh, as you sort of led us to, and, and I, I want people to grasp, is that ego hides. And what I mean by that is that most people don't know that they're in an ego state and 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 human beings are masterful at rationalization telling ourselves rational lies in order to not give up the ego state whatever that might be so you know it's fine that we get to values it's fine that we get to all that but we still got to do this heightened levels of self-awareness and then even when one has the heightened level of self-awareness the levels of uh self-acknowledgement of that awareness and the willingness to change so those are those are different levels talk to us a little bit about that because a to know uh b to be aware and to actually take an action and ownership those are different levels so can you walk, walk us through a little bit of that okay so tr traditionally people have have said that you know values are the most important thing they're the core thing that's where we need to start in some ways it is, but the, the, but the problem is, and you've hit the nail on the head in a way, is that you can't deal with your ego and or with values for that matter, unless you've learned to raise your awareness and to manage your emotions. Because at the end of the day, those values and that ego has to convert into behaviors. Okay. Absolutely. So, so the way we would put it is you need to learn the behavioral side first as a platform. Mm -hmm. Once you've done that and you've raised your awareness, then it is easier to go to the next level, which is to raise your level of consciousness. And we sort of differentiate. I mean, it's, you know, these, these words um, are, are difficult in that different people will have different definitions of them. Sure. So, so what is really important when we start down this path is that everybody understands the definition we are using in our mm -hmm. context. And the way we would use awareness is, 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 is primarily about observation. Mm -hmm. Whereas con raising your consciousness is not only about observation, but it's also about action. Mm -hmm. so yes. It's about putting that observation into action. Um, and that's where um, you have to go into your inner self at a, uh, a much deeper level um, to really work on on values and and ego exactly so you you have a uh, a big background corporately and you know you worked as a senior executive in major international corporations uh, I think you said in Sweden Holland Singapore US UK um, I'm guessing that at that, maybe I'm wrong, uh, that at that time, uh, this, this idea of, uh, transpersonal leadership, um, of even emotional intelligence would have probably been, uh, out in the nether regions of your consciousness yourself. Uh, well, how did you get wake awakened to this? Okay. So I think the way that I got awakened to it was 
was really there were a few stages. One was when um, I attended a, a advanced management program at Columbia, and I was surprised that it was something that was organised by the company I was working for at the time, Combustion Engineering. They, they, it was a uh, what shall I say? It was a customised program for them, but it was at that level, and. Um, one of the things that I noticed over this sort of 12 week course was that we spent one morning on leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and the only question that they asked was whether we were demo tended to be democratic or autocratic. That was the only discussion. <laughs> and the other, then the other thing in the room was that I found out that from answering various questions that I was the only one who was on the democratic end. Everybody else was on the autocratic end. Wow. Um, and yet amongst those people, I was probably one of the youngest, but I was, I, I was, you know, a high flyer at that time. And I was, um, considered to be quite a good leader. So I knew that it wasn't wrong just cause I was the only one being democratic. Mm -hmm. And then if we fast forward and then I didn't really think much about leadership for a long time. I just sort of got on with a day job like we all do. Um, and it was only when I started a new company um as an entrepreneur once i left corporate um and i built up this sort of uh, mini european conglomerate where there were managers from various european countries and i was trying to bring them together as the as the management team as the leadership team mm -hmm. and so i employed somebody to to do a 360 on each of us and at that time this is in the late 80s so i mean it's a long time ago and it's before the internet and so on and so forth so it required Church. It required a psych, uh, psychologist to go around and ask everybody what they thought, basically, about each other. Sure. Um, and when I got my feedback, uh, there were, I think there were quite a lot of positive things, which I can't remember now, but I remember two negative things. Right. One was that I intimidated people, which I had no idea about. Right. Um, I mean, it would be good if I can intimidate people when I want to do it, but not when I do <laughs> I was obviously doing it when I didn't want to do it as well. And the second thing uh, was that um, I didn't care. They thought I didn't care. Now, I knew mm. I cared about people, but I obviously wasn't communicating it. Right. Um, so they were two, you know, fairly major things that I'd been, you know, in, I'd been leading for many years and I didn't know about. Pretty simple stuff. Um, and unfortunately, very unfortunately, the, the, um, the guy who did the, you know, the psychologist he died in a car accident before he actually had a chance to help me to uh, to find the solution to this <laughs> so i sort of you know it was on the back burner again for a few years and it was only some years later when i was approached by one of the big accounting firms of whether i'd be interested in moderating a group of ceos of their clients right um, to help with their personal development and I was offered, you know, co training as a coach and as a facilitator to do that. And as I was running my why own... Did they, why did they ask you to do that? Um, because, oh, that's a good question. I, I was a non-executive director of a strategy company. Mm -hmm. And I would happened to get involved in one project because it was a Dutch company and I'd lived in Holland. And so I knew something about the Dutch culture and so on and so forth. Right. And... I came into contact with the auditors of this company and I, you know, together with a couple of other guys, helped them to solve their problems. And as a result of, as a result of that, one of the partners identified me and thought I had the right kind of, right kind of leadership skills to do that, which was, you know, uh, generally a participative, interested type of style. Um, at that time, I didn't know what coaching was. So. Right you know, as a definition. So I wouldn't call them, call myself that. So I got the chance to be, to be trained. And then when I was working with these chief executives, um, you know, it was like them being a mirror to my, my career, you know, some were, they weren't all like, like me, but I, there were certain aspects. And so yeah. I could, I could see the kinds of issues they were having and they were the kind of issues that I'd had all my career. Mm -hmm. And yet I'd spent my career, looking at the symptoms rather than the yes. cause. Yes. And that's what they were doing as well. And we carried out some action learning sets to, which is a, a, a process to help people 
you know, a group of people find a solution for one person. And they were very successful, but they kept on coming back with the same kind of problems. And guess what? They were all about people. Yes. They're all about people. They're all about behaviors. And that was when um, we decided to get involved, or I decided to get involved with emotional intelligence. Uh, and it was, it was starting to, so I, we were able to use that group as a sort of a laboratory. It wasn't intended to be that at the start, but that's what it became because then right. the accounting firm weren't interested uh, in continuing. They changed managing partners, so they decided to offload that business. Um, I and a couple of colleagues took it over on a part-time basis and got the Institute of Directors to brand it. And so sort of we, we ran it for a number of years and expanded it a little, little bit. So we had about 50 CEOs in different cohorts that we were using as a laboratory with their knowledge to develop <clears throat> programs. So that's how, it, that's how the whole thing developed. And that's how I came into realizing how important behaviors were. And it was only when I started to work with behaviors that I then we really realized, and I was working with a group of people, it wasn't just me, um, we realized that actually the values were the key thing once you'd, once you'd got to the behaviors, right? Um, but not before. And then it became obvious that, you know, one of the things that we're not doing when we're developing leaders and promoting leaders in our organizations is we're not really focusing on their values. I mean, basically we should be saying if people don't have the right values or aren't at least aware of their need to develop their values, they shouldn't be on any career ladder at all. But the truth of the matter is, John, that you know, in, even in our work when we, we're working with these companies, uh, very often, uh, even if somebody quote unquote knows their values, um, very often in the deeper work that we do, we discover those are actually not their values at all. They're actually adopted values. They're the values that I should have. Yes. You know, yeah. well, you know, and even at a corporate level, so well, what is the value of, the, of this of this company? And they say, oh, you know, we're all about integrity. And well, you have no integrity with your employees. So clearly yeah. it's not a value or, yeah. or, or about innovation. What the hell does that even mean? You know, yeah. you know I, I, I wipe my bum with my left hand instead of my right hand, I'm innovative. I mean, what does that actually mean? So I think that when we get into a values conversation, um, it's very difficult for people to actually elicit their own uh, true values as opposed to their uh, adopted value states that were given to them corporately, familiarly, culturally versus personally. So talk to us about that because I mean, we have a very specific process for that, but I'm fascinated to hear how you confront that. Okay, that's, that's uh, again, really good questions. Um, I think what the way we start by doing is by getting people to start talking about what were the good things about the leaders that they had themselves and the bad things of the leaders they had themselves. And, mm -hmm. and you know, they'll come up with a few non-value type things, but most of it, most of what they come up with will be values and behaviors. And mm -hmm. you can identify from that to start with what they appreciate in values. So you can, you can get to grips with what they think the key, value, key values are. Um, the, next, the next step is to provide them with a list of values that are the most common in all the research that we've done amongst leaders, okay? Um, and we've, what we find is that there are three or four uh, that come up over and over again, as you said, integrity, um, excellence, truth and honesty, uh, courage, um, those kind of things. They, they will come up time and time again in any, any survey that you do. And these, most of these leaders will put those at the top. But then you, you look at the other list, uh, the other part of the list and you say, well, what about forgiveness? What about fairness? What about patience? What about humility? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about what about love? I don't mean romantic love, obviously, but uh, altru altruistic love. And you start to engage people with those things, and then they start to realize that actually those things are quite important to them, particularly in their home life. 
and they you know they will recount issues of where they've had problems with patients with their children and so on and so forth and how they've forgiven somebody and so on and then you you start to ask them well do you do this in your work well i, tr I try not to you know I try to keep away from that well what would happen if you brought it into the work mm -hmm. and so it's what we call the soft values yes are really often the ones that make the difference so that's the sort of sim you know that's a right. Uh, yeah, because I think that part of the the, uh, the trap of ego is that the ego likes to compartmentalize and it likes the idea that there is a working you and there is a personal you and that's complete bullshit. The truth of the matter is there's you and, yeah. and you can put on the mask when you get to work, yeah. but you will leak out. You know, and I, I, I love the way Oprah put it years ago and she said, money doesn't change people it magnifies people <laughs> that's the truth with power as well and and you know so it power doesn't change people it magnifies them if you're a dick you're just going to be a bigger dick with money or power and if yeah. you're a kind and generous and caring and loving person but i think that if you are that other side which is a kind loving caring compassionate person and you've been brought up in a system that tells you that 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 doesn't have a place in business that is likely to get repressed in what you and I are talking a lot about and getting out there, uh, working with companies and on platforms and saying, no, this is actually what you need to bring forward. This is actually what makes you into not just a good leader, but a spectacular leader yeah. because leadership is first and foremost, a people business. Yeah. You know, if you don't know how to be with people, you're always going to be a terrible leader. I don't care how good you are at the spreadsheet or, or, or getting to the numbers. The bottom line is if you can't handle people and you can't lead people by actually having compassion and caring and loving and those softer value sets, nobody's going to stay loyal to you anyway. And I mean, that's what I wrote my last book on fiercely loyal was, and it's about, well, how do you get people to be loyal? It isn't better pay. It's be a better human. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's, 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 it's a, I mean, it's obviously it's a subject you and, and I can't can demand it either. No, you can't demand it. Well, you can, but it won't work. That's the, the point of it. Yeah. So, so when, um, when we look at this, you know, you and I have another subject area that's part of your work and my work that, that crosses over. And I'd love for us to explore it a little bit, which is neuro leadership, the, the, the neuroscience of leadership, because I think that, again, Leadership is often seen very much on the surface. It's, you know, uh, when I we did this survey, and when I asked, well, what does it mean to be a great leader? You know, I have to have a vision and I have to have a plan. And, you know, it's all that hard, nitty gritty stuff. Um, and you and I both know that those things are important. There's nothing wrong with them, but the, the, the human side is more important. Um, but that there's actually a change in the brain chemistry and even the plasticity of the brain as a result of that, talk to us a little bit about neuro leadership as you grasp it and as you share. Okay. Well, I think one of the, one of the most uh, eye-opening moments for me was to realize that we were born with a stone age brain. Basically, you know, when we're born with a, we've got the same brain, virtually small differences, but virtually a stone age man. And, mm -hmm. and the only thing that is different between me and you versus somebody of the same age in the stone age is what's happened to us during our life and mm -hmm. how our brain has been, been rewired yes. as a result of our experiences. And much of that is serendipity and chance. You know, who, who your parents were, where you were brought up, where you went to school, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and education, obviously is a very important part as well but most of that we we as a, an individual have not chosen not until we became at, the, at least a late teenager or, mm -hmm. or an adult so most of that rewiring has been by chance mm -hmm. and if we're lucky most of it has been good if we're unlucky most of it has been bad right um so but we get to a stage as an adult where we have the choice to be proactive in rewiring our brain rather than just letting it, letting it happen. And so the, the basis, the foundation of what we're trying to do is to say, okay, there is a natural adult development 
if you if you read you know Keegan or Wilbur or those those people who've done a lot about ad adult development, they will say that you know less than five percent of the population reach uh, the most uh, mature um, level of human development, and that's because it's all through chance. So what we are saying is well. As a leader in particular, I mean, it's true for anybody, but particularly as a leader, if we can accelerate that adult development, so what we get naturally when we're in our 40s, where we can actually bring some of it forward, we won't bring all of it forward, but bring it, some of it forward into 20s and 30s by helping people to know what they need to do to proactively rewire their brain, to be in control of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds terrible in one way to rewire your brain, but actually, you know, we're doing it all the time when we learn to drive Every a car day. or learn to swim or, you know, whatever we're, we're doing that. So doing it with behaviors and values is, is, is basically the same, a little bit different, but basically the same. So that's the, that's the sort of, um, that's the sort of the, the, the grounding that was really important to me to realize that, you know, as a human being, there are always those Stone Age defaults that we're going to revert to unless we can unless we can learn habits that rewire our brain, hardwire our brain in a different way so that they won't go back to default. Yeah, I mean, and I, I, as for you listening, viewing, watching, seeing, that, hearing, listening to this right now, I want to remind you that everything that you do with great ease was at one time difficult. It was at one time difficult. You do it with great ease now and you don't even think about it. You can actually drive from point A to point B and go, how the hell did I even get here? Because your mind can wander. But if the first time you drove, you probably had sweat running down your back. You were trying to think about how to let the clutch out at the same level as give it some accelerator and not run people over and stay in the road. And you know all those many complexities that are driving, now you can do without even thinking about it. And it's the same thing to understand that the adaptive theory of the brain around plasticity is exactly that, that it is difficult at first because neurons that, that wire, fire together, wire together, the more you do something, the more it fires together. And sometimes that means you're doing shitty stuff. You're doing stuff that doesn't work. And the problem with that at an egoic level is that the ego likes things to be the same. It doesn't like change. The ego likes to keep things in the status quo. So every, and this is what I just want everybody to grasp. Every time you change, every time you confront the idea of changing, you are actually going to bump into your ego. So as I said earlier, when we think of ego as being this egoic, Da -da -da -da, and here I am. No, no. Your ego is also saying, play small. Keep it small. Keep it the same. That's not mess with stuff. It says it, the, one of the greatest phrases of the ego is, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. And that's actually a completely egoic statement. It, because at a non-egoic statement, it's how can I make it better? How can we improve this? How can we make this more generative? How can we create greater levels of adaptability? And the more you adapt the brain, the more you stop those neurons firing together and you take them into a different pathway, the greater the expanse of your brain and the greater, the more neurons, the more neuro connections you have and your ability to adapt and change it and move into different places is so much better. So at an, confronting your ego has so much to do with confronting your own resistance to change at the simplest possible level. And that's a very important point. Do you agree? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, again, it goes back to, the, to our Stone Age default of, um, you know, survival, safety, more absolutely. of the same, etc. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, uh, and one of the things, of course, that a leader needs to do um, is not be resistant to change, is to welcome change. Yes. Be sensible about it, but welcome it. Yes. Uh, and, you know, we know that most people resist change. And particularly, the, as we see, higher up the organization a leader gets, fortunately, there are yeah. exceptions, but quite often they, they want more of the status quo and less change. Yeah, exactly. Now, you, you also, uh, I believe you lectured at Oxford University? Yeah. Tell us about that. What were you, what were you doing there? Because that's rather well, prestigious. <laughs> yeah, well, it was actually um, primarily uh, working with uh, graduate students, MBA students, um, that were coming over from 
the United States uh, for uh, you know a week or two weeks or three weeks um, training a sort of a uh, swap where some of the Oxford students went to uh, and they were they were um, learning neat things that uh, hopefully they hadn't learned in the, at their home university um, and it was quite interesting that uh, I mean it's always I always find a lot of fun working with uh, with students but particularly American students who um, and the diversity we you know the, there was a greater diversity in general than we have in the have in the UK um, and it was just remarkable how interested they were. That, I mean, that gives me the sort of the belief in all this stuff is that yes. the young people, the next generation, they get it. Mm -hmm. um, and they're the ones that at the moment are the, are the followers, if you like, be, beginning to become the leaders. Um, and they're the next generation of leaders. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, the senior leaders at the moment, or most of them, um, don't really understand that generation and what their needs are. It's not about understanding. Of course, every generation is different, but that's part of the awareness thing. That's part of the awareness is understanding what is, what is motivating those people, those young people. And they have very different needs than I had in my career. I mean, you know, of course I, I was expecting to have, I didn't work out that way, but I was kind of expecting to have, you know, one job. Yeah, from when I graduated. The forty-year career and a yeah. gold watch at the end. Exactly. Yeah. And I had a few few friends and colleagues who who managed, who did do that. Whether that was yeah. a plus or a minus, it doesn't matter. But it was different. Right. And the world is different. Now, now you and I have been talking about how important it is for us as leaders to embrace change, and we've also talked about how as leaders we also resist change uh, as as a. I often say that, you know, when I'm working with a leader or an organization, they, they want all things to change as long as they don't have to. <laughs> this stuff has got to change as long as I don't have to. So what is one thing that you did for a long time that actually blocked you from the level of success that you've managed to attain and, and, and the notoriety and what it is you do? I find that all of us can look back and say, you know, if I had done this a bit quicker, <laughs> What was the one thing that was actually blocking you from your success? Okay, well, I think two things. There were three things, but oh. two things I've mentioned earlier, which was about the intimidation and the not caring factor. They were things that were really negative that I didn't know about and I should have known about much earlier. Mm. Uh, but the, on the other side, um, there was the fact that I used to keep people too long sometimes. People who were of bad values, didn't have the same purpose of the organization, were manipulative. They may have had some particular skill that was important and you know, revered somehow. Um, and they used that for their ego and for their power and their positioning. And I should have been stronger in a number of cases to just cut them because what happened when I did eventually get around to doing it maybe it was a lack of courage maybe it was a maybe it was too much kindness I don't know which you know where the error was uh, exactly I think it was in both sides probably um, but as soon as they went then everybody came and said oh wonderful why, why didn't you get rid of him you know or, or her tw 10 years ago um, so I think that um, that is a really important lesson is that you know, people who do tend to be uh, kind and forgiving, and they can they can make that mistake of being too much that way and not being not being objective. So again, you're coming back to the emotional intelligence of actually staying clear on values, yeah. and <clears throat> and saying, well, you know, if because I think there are oftentimes, uh, particularly those of us who are caring and who are kind we look at the potential of somebody and we see the good in them and we know they can do great. And then if you add to that factor, um, what I call the diva factor, meaning that there's something they do spectacularly well. So you go, you know, this person is amazing at sales and they do great numbers and yeah, they're kind of awful with people, but I see good in them. Then you, what you've actually done is, you know, you, you, you're poisoning your own entire culture. And when people, when a boss will, or a leader will come up to me and say, yeah, but we can't afford to lose Charlie or Susan because they are 20% of our sales. And I say, how many other salespeople do you have? And they go five. So I go five divided, uh, 20 divided by five is what? They tell me that. I go, I guarantee 
every salesperson's sales will go up by at least that amount when you remove the toxic person. And they go, really? Yeah, try it out. And they're like, oh my God. Because yeah. they don't realize that, that, you know, and again, it's that kindness. Uh, I do believe it's that. I want to believe it's that at least. That actually has them keep that person and want to believe it. And it's also the fear of loss of, you know, if I lose the sale. So again, I think a, we're back to this piece around self-knowledge and being so solid in saying, this is what matters. These are our values. This is what our purpose is as an organization. And even if you're a superstar diva, even if I see your potential, if you're not willing to change and, and grow and create yeah. what's needed, we have to let you go. Yeah. And I think the other thing that is really important is that we have to, we have to make sure that, that that individual understands what the expectation is because often, often as a leader, we're not clear on that either. You know, we may be high, in our own mind, not be comfortable about what that person is doing, but not actually mm -hmm. make it absolutely clear. Yes. And, um, <sighs> I just, I just, I don't know that people generally do enough of that work on themselves to make that, uh, to make that decision. Like I said, you know, it's not just the, the, the self aware, uh, the, the self knowledge it's the self awareness, which as you said earlier is the, the action I'm willing to take. Mm, absolutely. You know, when we look at, um, when we look at this transpersonal journey, it is a journey, and I think that that's a piece that most people miss, don't you? Absolutely. I mean, if you look at uh, the actual development program, it might take a year or so on, but but it but it but it's lifelong. I mean, that that first year is is just getting getting to understand what you need to do, mm -hmm. and you may you may well uh, be able to change two or three granular behaviours during that period of time. But it's a, it's an ongoing, it's a lifelong thing. I mean, I'm st I, I, well, you know, I'm no nothing special, but I'm I'm still struggling with certain things, and I I know about this, you know, from an intellectual point of view very well. But I study with uh, with having patience. I, I, you know, there's lots of things that 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 we as human beings have to be aware of those those drawbacks and not not beat ourselves up about them. Not we can still have a, our inner self-confidence and be happy and fulfilled with who we are, but at the same time, be willing to be aware of the things we need to continue to improve and work on. You know, and you brought, you brought up something there that I think is really important. Um, again, the journey, it's always going. And I bring this up all the time with my guests is that I think that oftentimes people watching, listening to us can look at, you know, John Knights and go, oh, you know, the guy's, you know, he's been executive level in multiple countries. He's spoken at Oxford University. You know, he works, he's worked with big companies. He, he's a consultant, yeah, he's an author, et cetera, et cetera. And this idea that you're there, you know, they look at Darwin's, you know, oh, you're, but you're already there. And one of the things that I like to bring up is that, no, we're all on this journey. So as a leader, as a conscious leader, somebody committed to their growth and and as successful as you are what is one thing that that you are still working on after all these years still working on within yourself um well there are a number of things but i think of uh, one of them on the emotional level one of them is empathy mm -hmm. um you know it was something that that uh, i really started to work on when i when I learned to coach, it was only when I learned to coach that I really understood what empathy was, to be quite mm. honest. Um, and it's interesting when I'm coaching somebody, I've got all the empathy in the world because I'm in that zone. I'm in the box. I'm doing my job. But, right. when, but when you're in your private life or you're walking down the street or so on and so forth, you know, I sometimes have to think twice about being empathetic. Um, I also, um, you know, I try very hard to be to be humble, but I but that doesn't work sometimes because you know the idea of being recognised of uh, of um, of getting some sort of reward for what you do um, comes and shows itself 
and you have of course. to you know but you but the, the the difference is it's not and it's not actually there's then nothing wrong with it as such but what is really important is to be aware of it and so that's mm. what i work on is really trying to be aware of um and conscious of what i do and how i act so at least if i do it wrong sometimes which of course i do of course I can reflect on that and maybe improve for the next time. Yeah, and I think it's uh, important for us all to recognize, again, that humanity in that none of us are there. And there are days when you are going to be spectacular. You're going to be amazing. You're going to be your most enlightened superstar, Elvis, Elvis without an ego version, you know, this sort of crossover between Elvis and Mother Teresa. Yeah. You know, you are, you're going to be there. And then there are going to be days when you're just in the crapper and you're terrible. And, and, and it's knowing that actually neither of those states in their polarity are exactly who you are. They're only who you were in any given moment. And the idea is to try and take a little more of the troughs and the, and the mountains out of it and just level it out a little bit. And as you said, that's a day-to-day -day discipline that's a, a mindfully paying attention and being willing to not give up. And I think this is the other part around the ego thing, because particularly leaders, you know, we're a type personalities and we have this mentality of, uh, I should know. I mean, I, I'm sure you've heard this too. Uh, I've heard a thousand, well, I should know that, shouldn't I? Why the hell should you know that? Yeah. Well, I, have you worked with leaders who were conscious? No. Then why would you know that? We always, we, we've always been saying that knowledge is power, but I think uh, that uh, that that died with the internet. Yeah, because you know, if knowledge was power, then everybody would have supreme power because there's more knowledge yeah. than you could possibly ever consume. So it's not knowledge, and in fact, it's interesting because uh, in that world, you therefore, if knowledge was power, you hoarded the knowledge in order to hoard the power, and in and in the world we live in now, 21st century leadership is exactly the opposite, which is actually giving away the knowledge is your power. Yeah. Being the share of information Absolutely. is actually where your power is. It's completely reversed, and it's a really powerful point. Yeah, and it's, and it's counterintuitive to, to, our current, to our current culture. And, and I think that's one of the things that is going to really has to happen over the next couple of decades, is that what is counterintuitive has to become intuitive. We have to change Absolutely. that. And I think the, you know, the millennium generation will help to make that happen. Absolutely. And Gen Z are on their way too. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, in the context of, of um, leadership beyond the ego, um, in the context of, of the work that you're doing, um, what do you see as the state of leadership today in a general sense? I mean, of course, political, but it could be corporately, you know, uh, what do, how would you assess leadership today uh pretty sad i mean overall i think it's pretty poor mm -hmm. i mean I, there are there are ex, there are exceptions there are brilliant exceptions but yeah. but in general i would say that leadership top leadership is pretty poor you go to most people yes, particularly in larger companies there's very few people who are fulfilled in their jobs mm -hmm. um there are always some but 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 but, but few um, and they will always, um, they, you know, so many of them will talk about how the leadership just doesn't care, just thinks of themselves and so on and so forth. And, you know, in the UK in particular, we have a productivity problem. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's 10% of productivity just in, in treating people properly and getting yes. that discretionary effort out of people because they want to rather than because they have to and yeah. most leaders don't realize that no um, you know. so when you know in a world that we live in where people are politically correct and terrified to offend um let me ask you what's your bravest opinion what is the opinion that might not be so politically correct that is that you think is certain something that people need to pay attention to Oh, that's really, really, really difficult. Um, I think that, for one thing, I think we need to 
separate out politics and religion from the way we live. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying that, you know, that a particular politics is wrong or right or a religion is wrong or right or any mm -hmm. particular religion. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying no. is we, we let it influence how we live our lives too much. And, you know, I mean, we all know from the past that most wars are caused by either politics or religion. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's, there's still, a, although we don't have as many wars, at least amongst the developed countries, we still have that uh, divi uh, div uh, divisiveness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, you can see that very strongly both in the States and in the UK at the moment over our various issues. Oh, and we're seeing it. We're seeing it in global politics. We're yeah. seeing, as I said, we're seeing in the intro, we're seeing divisive politics rise across the world. We're seeing tribalism rise across yeah, the world. We're exactly. seeing, you know, uh, uh, we're seeing right wing. Uh, and, and I think that it's interesting because, you know, people are th people on the left throw around titles like, you know, fascist about about say Donald Trump. But one of the things that I think that why the right can often say, well, we're not fascists is because they're capitalists. And fascism in its old form, you and I are a little older than, than maybe some of our viewers or listeners. But when we think of fascism, particularly those of us who grew up with understanding world history, you know, we, we had Franco, you know, uh, out of Spain, and we had Adolf Hitler and Mussolini. And a lot of the times those uh, fascist movements were socialist based. Yeah. And now what we're seeing is the rise of, uh, of uh, the fascist who's a capitalist. So capitalist fascism is the rise, which is it's, yeah. it's about greed and leadership yeah. from that dictatorial. And if you disagree with me, you're gone. Jeff Sessions, as we're recording this, was gone just two days ago because he didn't agree with Donald Trump. Uh, yeah. That, you know, that, again, that lack of compassion, that lack, lack of empathy, that lack of willingness to to reach across to people we don't agree with. And I think that if we're going to lead without ego, or we're gonna manage the ego at least, we can't lead without it, but manage the ego, one of the most important things we could possibly do is be willing to look at how someone else is right, if not in the general sense, but in right for them. And that's where the compassion that you talked about and the empathy that you talked about is so vitally important. Yeah and seeing things from other people's perspective. And I would, I mean, one of the things that I would, you know, if I could wave a magic wand, I would add emotional intelligence and, and values um, to, the da to the daily curriculum of children from the age of about three. You know, it should, it should be on the same level of importance as reading, writing, and arithmetic, or maths, as you say in the States. Yeah, and, and I fully agree with you, and, uh, and I think that's, one of the great downfalls of our society is that we are emotionally ignorant. You know, what is that. what is really interesting is that um, if we look back into the industrial revolution, the thing that made that work was the education of the masses. Of course. And yeah. what we need to do now in the information age is we need to educate the masses again, but in a different way, in yeah. a much more complex way. Well, I mean, in the industrial age, the educational system was designed through the Prussian school system, the Prussian learning system, which was trained, was there to help people to memorize and do things by route because it was the beginning of industrial age, but people would work basically as machines. Now we have machines doing machine jobs and yeah. people need to be able to conceptualize and think at a bigger level. And this is why the educational system of memorization is falling down. And we need to teach people how to think at a bigger level, to think at beyond ourselves, beyond our egos and beyond our own self-interest, but to think globally and even universally. And that is, uh, it's a very interesting place that you and I could probably have a whole hour on just in that subject. Absolutely. John, we, as we come towards the end of the show, let's, let's, let's have a bit of fun. Tell me what brings you joy? Um, well, the immediate thing that comes into my mind are my grandchildren, I guess, but that's, uh, you know, that's not unusual. Um, their, you know, their love of life, you know, I'm, and I'm talking particularly of the, the young, young ones. I have a, a 21 year old grandson now, but, but the young ones who are four, five, three, you know, they're pure at this point in time. That, that's what gives me the most joy. But, uh, but I also have to not think too much about the fact of how 
the world will will influence them as they grow up and hopefully i can have some impact on them you know remaining true to themselves yeah and just honoring that you know it's one of the things i have grandchildren too and one of the things i i love about little kids is is this thing that I, th I think is so natural to who we are and we lose it so quickly and that is curiosity yeah absolutely like, kids are just curious they ask yeah. you know yeah. why is water called water yeah damn that's yeah. a good question absolutely. right <laughs> that's a good question but that wonderful curiosity and and to not shut it down is so vital and i think yeah. that that is for you know i've talked about this many times in in my writings in my in my lectures in my presentations in my trainings is if i could wave the magic wand one of the things i'd bring back is you know r to reignite your curiosity particularly about the things you think you know yeah absolutely. because that's the problem I, I already know that i don't yeah. know yeah well you probably don't or you don't know yeah. the next level of it the next depth of it what is what is, what's what's a guilty pleasure for john knights a guilty pleasure um well, for some people, it's binge watching Netflix. It's, what is it for um, you? I don't know. I I, I think that um, I don't I don't know that I have any guilty pleasures at the moment. I mean, I think I had probably lots of guilty pleasures pleasures when I was younger. But I'm just I'm happy to be where I am um, at my age, fit, healthy. Um, had a very lucky and happy marriage for 45 years um and i think um yeah i don't think i've got any real secrets i think i've always in fact one of my friends said to me not not long ago he said you know there's a lot of things that i hate about you but one thing at least is good and that's that you're transparent <laughs> <laughs> so uh as we as we close up the show, please tell our listeners of you something that you a practical piece of guidance that you would like for them to walk away with that you would like them to implement because it's practical, uh, preferably in the next twenty four hours, but certainly within the, within the next few working days that you go, you know, you want them to walk away with this and go and put it into action. What would that be, John? Okay, so what I'd like people to do is to in the next 24 hours or even to reflect over the last 24 hours is to think of a situation where you were unhappy you got angry about something um, and it may be you know when you were crossing the road or driving the car or with the children in the morning or whatever it doesn't matter what it is but just think about what went wrong and think about how you behaved and how things could have been different if you had to behave differently. And what would that behavior have been? Mm -hmm. And if you can think that to yourself, then you're identifying something that you could actually change. Very good. Beautiful. This has been a great conversation, John. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for, for Thank joining you. us. Thank you for bringing your wisdom to, to our audience. Please tell our viewers, our listeners, where they can find out more about you and all the wonderful resources that you offer. Okay, so well, our website is leadershapeglobal.com. So you can find out everything there. Um, and uh, particularly look on the front page for a link to our new book, Leading Beyond the Ego, where they can find out more about it and also where to buy it. Um, and the other thing I'd just like to mention is connected to the book is that uh, Routledge, the publisher, have also published free, um, sorry, eight free white papers that, are, that can be downloaded. Wonderful. Uh, which are on applications of transpersonal leadership. So if you want to just get a flavor of what transpersonal leadership is about, download one of those, one or two of those white papers first. Fabulous. Thank you, John. It was a real pleasure. Hope you'll stay with us to the end as we sign off. And uh, I want to say to you, uh, remember, you can chat about this or any previous episodes of the show on our Facebook page community. Just go there to Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Podcast. Uh, you can chat with our guests. You can chat with other listeners and, you know, tell us what you've gotten out of the show and what you're going to do with it. And remember, the research consistently shows that one of the biggest challenges facing the most successful companies can be somewhat counterintuitive in that these fast-growing companies often hit a point where they realize they're spending 
an absolute fortune attracting, training and developing talent only to have them leave at an alarming rate. If you're sick of investing in training and developing your talent only have them leave before you get your ROI, then come talk to us at fullmontyleadership.com where we provide you with the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets inside of your organization by tapping into purpose fullmontyleadership.com, providing you with the concrete soft skills to keep you and your organization at the top. Why? Because you can't outsource authenticity. Also remember to stop by the matrix, matrix matrix.fullmontyleadership.com. You don't need a triple W, just matrix like the movie, dot fullmontyleadership.com and get your authentic leadership matrix self-assessment tool it's valued at 197 you get it absolutely free for being a regular listener and a viewer remember you can check catch us also on google play and on alexa by simply saying play dog baron podcast thank you for sharing the show with everyone you know till next time stay curious my friend stay curious about how your ego may be in the way of you truly leading at the level that you can lead. Think about what it would mean to be a transpersonal leader. Till next time, I'm Dov Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out.